Good morning. I'm glad to see everybody up. This is uh, amazing that you guys do anything at 8.45 in the morning on Sunday, so I'm very impressed. <laughs> These are the hearty Christians here in Los Angeles. Glad you're up, and we're going to keep talking about feelings this week. So this is uh, the second in my series of three on my uh, new book, Managing Your Emotions for a Healthier Life. We're doing this series. What does the Bible have to say about feelings? And uh, we're going to keep uh, diving into that. Today, we're specifically going to deal with the topic of what's the point of feelings anyway. So uh, I think last week was instructive for me. I was going to talk about COVID and isolation and continue this conversation that we've been having about how to deal with all the emotional stress that's happening in our lives right now. But several of the questions that came up last week led me to believe I need to kind of back up rather than just talk about feelings. I think we need to talk about talking about feelings. In other words, why are we talking about feelings? What's, what's the point of that in the first place? Several of the questions that came out made me thought, let's, let's back up. So I'm actually gonna do a talk that I did at BPC 15 years ago and I'm going to do that because some of you weren't there. And those of you were, there's no way you could remember it. So I'm going to uh, <clears throat> share these thoughts that we, I introduced to you uh, many, many years ago. And uh, I think are foundational. Uh, why are we talking about feelings in, in our uh, day and time? Uh, what's the point of uh, focusing on emotional intelligence and, all, and a lot of research that's gone into uh, what we in psychology call affects? And I think there's a, there is a, a, a very uh, wonderful synchronicity with what the Bible has to say with how we should live and what current psychological research is saying about emotions. So that's what we're going to be dealing with, dealing with today. Now, I guess we have to start with asking the, the question, see if I can share this screen. All right, can you see that screen? Could, the, you can see it, Carolyn? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Great. What does it mean to be an emotionally healthy Christian? What does that mean? Let's, ask, let's start by asking that question. Uh, not everybody agrees uh, on what that means. Some people think what, what it means to be an emotionally healthy person uh, is just to say whatever feelings you've got, you just express them. If you can express your feelings, that means you're emotionally healthy. On the other end of the scale, a lot of people believe that the whole point of emotional health is to control those feelings. As to be someone who's very managed in your emotions, someone uh, who's maybe th that doesn't let things get to them. Um, they're able to stay even in every situation. So we've got these extreme ideas of what, what it means to be emotionally healthy. And if you're on one end of that scale and you're married to someone who's on the other end of that scale, you've got problems. Uh, you, your definition of what emotional health is can be, can be opposite. So I wanna uh, ask that question today. Uh, what, what does that mean? Let me give you an example. Uh, I have been doing therapy for decades and in, in early on in my career, a guy came to me who had been involved in a, in a group in Santa Monica, a very large group in, in Santa Monica, this is several decades ago, that was into emotional expression. So what they would do is they would get groups of people and they would put them in literally padded rooms. The walls were padded around the rooms. They would give them batakas. Do you remember what a bataka is? Anybody remember what that is? Yeah, it's a foam bat. Uh, and they would hit each other with the bats. Uh, this was to get their primal emotions out. So he spent years in this group getting his primal feelings out. And if, if he, he got into a rage and he would beat the guy next to him with his foam bat and the guy would beat him with a foam bat, uh, they would yell and scream. And at the end of each of those sessions, the group would applaud because uh, this client who had now come to me would, was really good at just expressing his feelings because that was the definition of emotional health. You need to get to those primal feelings, get all the way back to viewing yourself in the birth canal. And as you're coming out, scream like you screamed the very first scream in your life. If you can do that, you're a healthy individual. Well, this particular guy had doubts about whether or not people really liked him. 
so he had to test this theory out with them, not on purpose, just kind of automatically. He would thought, well, if that's good, if you guys think that's good, well, I've taken up a notch. So he would challenge the uh, the moderators there, the people, the, the trainers. He would turn furniture over, scream and yell, jump up and down. He thought, if you want to see emotion, I can show you emotion. And uh, finally, one of the one of the therapists there confronted him and said, what, what are you doing? And he said, I'm just trying to express my true feelings. And they said, well, you can't do that here. And he, he ended up getting kicked out of the group because he was too, oh. too emotional. Somebody have a question? All right, well, if you, if you do, just unmute yourself and ask. So the idea that just expressing your feelings as emotional health didn't work. And that was popular in psychology a few decades ago. If you've got it, you need to get it out. And that, it, that's the definition of health. That's what they thought. We found out that's not right. That is not the de definition of, of, of emotional health. Emotions themselves serve the function. They're a physical appraisal of your environment. You, they're automatic. Emotions come out that are, that are automatic. But when you express those uh, uh, emotions, they are for a purpose. And the purpose of expressing emotions is to create connections and relationships. Emotional health, true emotional health is the capacity to experience your feelings and to respond to the feelings of others in a way that connects you and it helps both of you grow. That's, that's the purpose. Now, my friend who had gone through all these years and paid all this money to uh, therapists to help him express his feelings missed the second half. They didn't understand that there is a, there's a meaningful use of your emotion, which is that it facilitates connection to other people on a deeper level. I like people who agree with my ideas, but I love people who respond to my feelings. That sense of emotional bonding comes from having someone respond to your emotions. You have a feeling, they have a feeling about your feeling, and when that expression comes out, there's a feeling of bond that happens. Just saying how you feel doesn't do you much good. It does you a lot of good if you say how you feel and you, those feelings are responded to by other people. So. Uh, I, I'm, I'm bringing you up to date on the latest theories of, of psychology. Emotional health is not just getting your feelings out. It's not just being in control of your feelings, but it is the skill of expressing them in a way that connects you to other people. Mark? Yeah. Mark, this is Bonnie. So when you're saying connects you to them and helps you grow, is it you singular, you the person is emoting, or is it helping both of you grow? It's both. It's both. You, the, the purpose of emotion is, is a relational connection. So it, it, the purpose is that both of you, both people, all people would know how to express and respond to emotion. So it's for both. Now, if you're just expressing your feelings and vomiting your emotions all over other people, that's not doing you or them any good. And I'm sure you know people like that. They're very liberal with saying how they feel. Uh, and it kind of makes you uncomfortable. It's like, well, am I supposed to, to say that back? I mean, uh, you know, you have to be in tune with the other person and share feelings <clears throat> that are appropriate for the context and hopefully with people who are willing to respond back. It's the response that closes the loop. So, so yes, we now know uh, that growth, our personal growth as, as humans is dependent upon our capacity to express and respond to emotion. Now, we didn't always know this. It's only been in the last few decades that we've developed MRIs that are able to take pictures of the brain that we never had before in all of human history. So we didn't know the participation of the emotional centers in the brain in our relational encounters to the degree that we understand them now. So this is, this is sort of a new understanding that we've got about the purpose of emotion. It facilitates relationship. That's the purpose. So you've got these feelings and you're not sure what to do with them. That's because it requires some skill for you to express your feelings in a way that will connect you to other people and invites them to respond back. Now you see the problem is it takes two. <clears throat> you expressing your feelings, <clears throat> that doesn't create a relationship. You have to have someone in relationship with you who can respond. That's what creates intimacy. That's what creates bonding is a responsiveness. It's an it's a emotional resonance back and forth. Now, an interesting thought is, you remember when Jesus said, 
Unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus was all about the kingdom of God here and now. He, Jesus, I don't know if you, if you really read what he had to say, Jesus never said, look, these are the things you need to do to get to heaven after you die. He never said that. Most Christians live that way. You know, Christianity is about figuring out what I need to do so I can get into heaven after I die. Jesus never said that. What he said is what we're trying to do is bring heaven here now. The kingdom of heaven is here now. And unless you become like little children, you're not going to get it. You're not going to benefit from it now, right now. How do we live as people in the kingdom of heaven now as, as little children? And what does that mean? I've got kids. You know, I don't necessarily think they're a good example of much of anything. So why, why would you want to say, make that statement? You know, you want to listen to the kids and do what they do. I would have stayed up all night last night if I was, you know, acting like my kids, right? <clears throat> what children are is dependent and spontaneous. They're spontaneously emotional. And they're not ashamed to be dependent. We are fundamentally dependent creatures. Uh, this, this notion that you can be independent, self-sufficient, not need anyone, God or anybody else, is not a healthy notion. Embracing the idea that I need other people, I need relationships, and I enter into those relationships spontaneously, emotionally, is a healthy way to live. I think he was giving us a, 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 a little bit of a hint of what health means. It's connection. Children are very much interested in connection, very much interested in connecting with each other, connecting with, with others, and they do that by expressing their feelings. And, and, and developing the, the ability to respond to them. <clears throat> and so that fits really nicely with what we now understand in psychology. Robert Stoller is one of the leading psychoanalysts in the, in the country. And he's made his whole theory of, of current contemporary psychoanalytic thought around this idea that there's been a shift in our thinking about psychology and psychoanalytic psychology from the primacy of drives to the primacy of affect. And what he's saying is Freud wasn't right, that we're driven by sex and aggression, and we've got these drives that really motivate us to do what we do. What motivates us are feelings. We're motivated to do what we do based on feelings. And that's really at the core of human motivation and the core of answering the question, why you do what you do. And there's this tremendous amount of science and research around this idea. You being aware of how you feel and, and uh, learning to harness the power of feelings and to uh, use that motivation to connect you to other people, that's the core of psychological health. So it's like Jesus was saying, uh, what's healthy for you to realize you're dependent upon your relationships with other people for, for health and you're able to be spontaneously emotional. Now, let me say this, I've got a caveat. What's the difference between spontaneous and impulsive? I'm sure you know people that just go with their feelings and it doesn't necessarily turn out very well for them in life. So what, what's, what's up with that? So it's the difference between spontaneous and, and impulsive. Someone who is impulsive is uncomfortable with their feelings and they impulsively do things to get away with whatever, to get away from however they feel. Like I'm feeling insecure, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling fearful. So I'm gonna impulsively do something to escape an uncomfortable feeling. A spontaneous person is someone who is moving towards a feeling. There's someone who says, I want to feel more of what I'm feeling. So I'm gonna spontaneously do this because it feels good. So people who are spontaneous don't have any shame about the feeling that they're feeling. They want more of it. Like after our talk today, some of you might say, I'm going to drive up to the snow. I would love to go drive up to the snow. Let's go do that. Come on, let's all get in our car and you drive up and play in the snow. That's a spontaneous thing because you're going to do something you want to do. An impulsive person is someone who's trying to escape uh, a bad feeling. And a spontaneous person is someone who wants to enter into more of a good feeling. So that's kind of spontaneity that requires maturity to know the difference between the two. What we're saying is that insight alone is no longer enough for good mental health. We now have to have emotional intelligence. I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, 
Daniel Goleman's work on emotional uh, intelligence, it's now uh, gotten into the common language. Uh, anyone who wants to be a good leader of other people can't just be smart. They've also got to be emotionally smart. You've got to have EQ as well as IQ to be effective in our society today. We now know that. You motivate people by inspiring them not old school demanding people do things, you inspire people to do things. If you inspire someone to do things, they're gonna to wanna to do those things even when you're not there. If you demand that they do things, they're only gonna do those things when you're standing over them watching them. So we need to have the uh, emotional intelligence to realize how people operate and what makes them tick. All right, let me, let me pause. Anybody have a question about any of that? Feel free to disagree. Many brilliant philosophers throughout history up until the last 50 years would, would disagree with what I'm saying. They didn't have MRIs. Yes, Mark, I have a short question. Can I interrupt for just one second? Yes. In organizations, I've been part of um, many firms that have essentially just a uh, top-down management for their vision and their direction. And the connection between the professionals in the organization and the management of the organization is largely economic. So this is our top-down vision. Uh, we think it's going to allow the organization to be uh, successful. And if the organization is successful financially, you as the foot soldiers will likewise be uh, successful financially. Right. Um, I would say that uh, that is probably, at least in my business, the uh, emotional management, if you will, of, of organizations. Have the insights of the difference between the, um, the value of expressing uh, feelings and the uh, ability to intelligently manage feelings. Has that, in your experience, expressed itself at the macro level as opposed to the, uh, it's kind of a false dichotomy, but the person-to-person -person relationship level? Right. We're, I, we're getting there. Um, <clears throat> I'm familiar with Jim Collins and his research, Good to Great, Built to Last. Uh, it's, this guy is a his, his research is all on identifying organizations and businesses in our culture here in America that last. So he did decades of research studying what companies in America, not just are successful now, but remain successful 10, 15, 20 years down the line. So he did a very long log longitudinal study. And who are the leaders of those organizations? And, and Colin's research pointed to, or he developed this concept of a level five leader. There are five levels and level five are the ones that, that lead organizations, not just to the successful now, but remain successful over time. And the, the, the two qualities that he found in level five leaders, the leaders of long-term successful companies in America were number one, uh, ambition for the good of the organization. And number two, surprisingly, humility. Uh, so, and everybody was shocked by that. Wait, what? You know, the, the leaders of the organizations that last the longest, humility is the number two most important. You'd think uh, charisma or intelligence or, some, or vision or something, but no, it's humility. And so as he dug into his research, he found those leaders were the ones that inspired like what I'm telling you now. They're able to figure out how to motivate people from the inside, not top down. Uh, and those are the organizations that last the longest because then they, they were able to, as I said earlier, inspire other middle management and other people in the organization to want to follow the vision, not have to follow because I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, I, I want to follow because I buy into the vision. So I would say it's getting there. It's getting out of the psychologist's office and into uh, corporate culture or uh, the macro level. Uh, now, I, we, we're not there yet. We're, uh, things, these things move slowly. And also, and uh, we're not gonna talk about it today, but 
uh, you can see from what I'm saying, you have to know your you have to know your context. You have to know your audience. When when you're when you're talking about feelings and feelings lead, lead, leading to connection, you've got to know if you're talking to someone who buys into that. If they don't, then it's going to be a bad idea for you to practice what I'm telling you. If, if I, you're going to be emotionally vulnerable with someone who has no interest in emotional vulnerability, that's going to be a bad experience for you. So the culture has to change. We have to, as a, as a culture, realize this is the way we healthily move forward, all of us. Uh, and so that's kind of why I'm doing these lectures. Uh, to, to, I would say we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet, is what I would say. Mark, could I say something? Um, yeah. I would like to challenge what you are talking Good. about. Great. We all have seen examples, especially in high tech, where it is quite clear that the people who develop these companies, that um, run these companies, have probably very little emotional intelligence, but they're very, very successful. Yep. And life is changing so fast. Things are moving so fast that it doesn't really matter. I mean, the long-term um, perspective of companies that are successful over the long term is becoming kind of it is not what it once was. So I would challenge what you are saying here about us moving there. I am not at all sure we are moving there. Not that I wouldn't want us to, and not that I don't agree with what you're saying, right. but I'm challenging that it's moving in that direction. Well, I guess we're, gonna, we're all gonna find out together. Um, I would say we live in an insane time. Uh, I think you all, you, all saw what happened to GameStop in the last week. Uh, it's insane. Uh, people, yes, there are people who are out for themselves and only themselves. There's no long-term game plan here with this GameStop thing, right? It's just how much money can we make right now for ourselves, almost like a, a LARP, you know? So yes, that exists. And there are people who are very focused on just the moment and they don't care about longevity. They don't care about uh, what, what's gonna happen in five, 10, 15, 20 years. And I would say uh, if those people went out in our culture, it's a sad thing for us. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, America will be a superpower in 20 or 30 years if we're just trying to uh, extract all that we can for ourselves in the moment. I'm telling you how long-term health works. And there are people uh, in like Jim Collins and others uh, there are uh, people who are looking at these ways of leading, these ways of being and saying, I think we need to wake up. Uh, we need to, it, how the emotional health of the people that work for me does matter. There are people who are saying that. Now, I, I, we'll, we'll find out together who's going to win out. Uh, the social media people who can create a mob and make uh, billions in a couple of days uh, and, and destroy other people's careers. Uh, or are we really trying to build something here that lasts? These are the principles that build something that lasts. Uh, there will always be people who are uh, selfish and they, and they want to take for themselves in the immediate moment. They don't care about the future. We'll see which one's out. We'll find out together. Uh, I have one question for you regarding your opening remarks about expressing emotions randomly. Yeah. I recall there was a bestseller and it circulated in Europe in the 70s, and it was called Urschrei, which means in English, primal scream. Was yeah. the bestseller here in the United States? And do you recall who was the author? Yeah, primal scream. Uh, that's actually the group I was just talking about. Uh, my client was with um, uh, Jarvel, uh, I'm blanking on his name. The guy who wrote Primal Scream had uh, a group in Santa Monica and they practiced these principles that I was, that was the very example I was giving, I started off giving. It doesn't work. Yes, and I, I rented them a house I owned on Abertini in Venice. Yeah. And the moment, the moment they moved in, they insulated all the walls so the sound doesn't penetrate throughout yeah. on the street. Yeah. And that was, and that was in the 80s. So that was yeah. still an active, activity in Venice. Yes, I, I'm well aware of it. And, and some of the people who are in that group 
who had such a bad experience ended up in my office. Is that uh, yeah. <laughs> and I was just telling you about one of the guys. He was he was very, very involved. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, it was uh, Arthur Janoff. Janoff, that's his name. That's right. Art Janoff. Can uh, I can I push back with a little more yeah. positive? Uh, sure. la last year there was a best selling New York Times book called The Originals. And the gentleman that, and I don't recall the author uh, that did the research for it, uh, looked at startups in Silicon Valley and tried to figure out, they had an endpoint. What were the successful ones and what were those that failed? And they looked at the criteria in their hiring practices. And the number one thing across the board was not whether they had tech experience or what their IQ was, uh, but it was how they got along with other people. There you go. That's emotional intelligence, I think. Exactly. That's, that, that's what I'm saying. And, and that's what I think people who are interested in building organizations that last, that last, they're, they're waking up to the importance of that. What was the name of that book again? I want to look that up. I muted no. myself. The Originals. That's why I love coming to Brentwood. I learn something every time. And, and if I could, I'll just riff on what Jim said there. I mean, I have to look at this in the light of how do I want to prepare my daughters to enter a workforce in 10 to 15 years? And do I focus on technology? Do I focus on their understanding of human beings? And what they hear me say ad nauseum is, you're always going to be working with and working for other people. And right. so if you understand people and how to communicate with them, how to work with them, even if technology becomes more and more important in our society, which it obviously is, um, you're going to ultimately be working with human beings. And if you understand them and how to work with them properly, you will always be able to find work. That's, I think it's wise counsel and that's emotional intelligence. That's what we're, that's what we're waking up to understand is really important, even in the marketplace, not just in the psychologist's office, but it makes organizations run more effectively and they last longer. Now, there will, again, there will always be people who don't buy into that. Uh, and uh, the, the power of making a lot of money in a short amount of time is pretty powerful. Uh, but I, I, well, you get what we're saying. All right, so let me let me move to the next question is then what does that look like? What does emotional health look like? Uh, I doubt that I'll get through all of these today because I never get through all my notes when I'm at Brentwood, which is what I like. I like it that way, so I ask the questions. Uh, there are four things I'm gonna talk about maybe. Emotional awareness, emotional flexibility, emotional tolerance, and emotional responsiveness. Emotional awareness, emotional flexibility, emotional tolerance and emotional responsiveness. So what is emotional awareness then? It's the capacity to grasp what's underneath the feeling that you're having. A basic problem that many of us have is we don't really know where our emotions are coming from. Uh, the main impediment to emotional growth is a lack of awareness of the depth of your feeling. Now, I have good news for you uh, there are not that many feelings. So I know some of you guys are thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to go back to school and learn all these emotions. How many are there? It's so complex. You try to talk to your wife and, and women have more developed emotional centers in their brain. So they have more language to express their feelings. Uh, men tend to be top down in the way we think. We want to know who's in charge. And women tend to think, well, who's related to who? Who's connected to whom? Uh, they they uh, were more encouraged to express their feelings growing up than men were. Men generally our age, the age of the people in the room here today. It's changing, it's not quite the same, but uh, uh, that has been that way historically. So good news in research, we know that there's maybe 10 roughly, uh, 10 to 15 basic emotions that you need to know. If you know and, and can articulate those emotions, you're gonna be miles ahead in the game in life. Anger, fear, sadness, hurt, 
surprise, disgust, guilt and shame, those are different but similar, joy and love. If you're really good at identifying and talking about each of those feelings, you're going to be a more successful person relationally in life. And in my book, the emotions that I focused on managing your emotions are hurt, guilt and shame, anger, anxiety, fear, sorrow, happiness, and love. So I have a chapter on each of those emotions, what the Bible has to say about those emotions, and then what psychology has to say about those emotions to help facilitate uh, your awareness of those feelings, it's sometimes we just need to be able to identify them. Now, uh, um, it's not that, there are, there are nuances. Let me say that. Some of these are blended emotions. You can have things like pride, jealousy, hope, doubt, complacency, boredom. These are blends. So these are like primary colors, primary emotions, and you can have blends. And that, that list can get quite long uh, when people are nuancing emotions. Okay, so here's the point about awareness that I want to make. There are primary and secondary emotions. Primary emotion is what I'm feeling in a direct response to the here and now. Primary emotion is a feeling that, that is a result of uh, this moment. A secondary emotion is a reaction to the primary. So what do I mean by that? Like anger is secondary to hurt or fear. The next time you get mad, you're probably mad because you're hurt, you're scared, or you're frustrated, or some other variant of those. So you see there is a deeper, more important emotion that you have to get to. If you stay at the secondary level, you're not gonna be effective in your communication of your feelings. There is a, there's a secondary coping feeling, like anger, it's the most popular, and then there's a primary, more vulnerable feeling under that. So this is what I mean by emotional awareness. The next time you have a feeling, do you know the feeling underneath that feeling? That's the question you want to ask yourself. Well, what else am I feeling? And especially in marriage, that's, that's a, the most common thing to ask yourself. Next time you get upset, ask yourself, well, what else am I feeling? That's emotional awareness. Do you know what's going on underneath the feeling uh, that, you, that you can identify? Uh, it, it came up last week uh, that um, some, some uh, men especially can be intuitive and yet not very good about expressing their feelings. Uh, they have feelings, but they don't name the feelings. Uh, so for you to be an intuitive person means you're an emotional person. You can sense the feelings of other people. You can immediately assess situation, make uh, intuitive assessments and uh, uh, suggestions that are that can oftentimes be quite brilliant. But if you can't name your own feelings, then you're not aware of the naming or the way to process or discuss feelings. You have to be aware of uh, what the name of the feeling is underneath the feeling. You've got them, but you can't name them. That, that limits you in uh, your, your effectiveness in your relationship. So the next time you have an emotional moment, a good question to ask yourself is what's underneath what I'm feeling right now? That's what we mean, mean by emotional awareness. What's underneath what I'm feeling right now? I know I'm mad, I got that. But just saying you're mad doesn't get you very far. You have to ask yourself, okay, what's underneath that? What's going on underneath that? Am I hurt? Am I scared? Am I ashamed? Do I feel guilty? Am I embarrassed? What is underneath that? That's a, a, an effective conversation will come when you're complete, completely or more completely aware of how you feel. I can't tell you how many... Uh, People come to me for marriage counseling, and in the first few sessions, what they end up saying is, "I, I think I made a mistake. You know, I, I this is this is we're we're not compatible. We're just too different." Uh, and that's because they're fighting all the time, but they don't know why they're fighting all the time. Uh, it's very common for people then to draw the conclusion that, well, you know, I get along with everybody else except for you, so I guess I just made a bad choice here. And what we find over time, in the vast majority of those cases, is that, yes, I know you're emotional and upset and distressed and angry, but you're actually not emotional enough. You don't know what's underneath that. And when we get to the hurt and the vulnerability and the fear underneath that, and when they start talking about the feelings underneath that, then all of a sudden this, this thought of uh, that we're not compatible goes away. It's, oh, we just didn't know how to talk about our more vulnerable feelings. Uh, we got stuck at the superficial level. 
it's a uh, that ability to name and get to the deeper feelings makes you a more successful person. It isn't it interesting that Jesus knew that too? He picked men who could understand with their hearts. And isn't that interesting? This guy, this Jewish rabbi, this 30-year-old Jewish rabbi in the in the Middle East with no media, uh, no social media, no internet, never wrote a book, took 12 ragtag guys and changed human history. Why? He picked emotionally intelligent men, men who could understand with their hearts. Uh, and just like Barry was saying, uh, those are the leaders that will shape history, the people who understand with their hearts. Jesus modeled that for us. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't take the richest. He didn't take the most successful. He didn't get the heads of uh, the, the uh, most successful organizations in his time. That's not who he picked. He picked a, a group of 12 people, 12 people who understood with their hearts and changed human history. It is the dominant religion on the planet uh, that, are, uh, that follow the teachings of Jesus. And he picked just the right people as the uh, purveyors of his, of his religion. So, Mark, yeah. um, if you move this on both the macro and the, and the uh, individual level, the, the predicate for the utility of your insight is that there is a incentive on either side of a given relationship for one to understand the origins of the emotional uh, context of the other, right? So in, in marital therapy, presumably the predicate is that the spouses desire to preserve the relationship and they enter therapy with the understanding that unless they, or through your counsel, unless they are able to understand and identify the emotional subtext of their partner, uh, the relationship is threatened. Now, right. that also works though at a macro level that either side of a, uh, a difference has to have an incentive to identify with, understand, and in some way accommodate the subtext of the emotional state of the polar position. And if there is no incentive for one side to do that, for example, if there's a huge uh, power disequilibrium in, in that particular situation, then the relationships I don't doomed is kind of melodramatic, but uh, the relationship is threatened in that context, right? Correct. Right. There has to be a reason to come to the table, right? <clears throat> uh, we decide ahead of time. Can we do business? Can we talk? Is there incentive to talk? Is there motivation to try to have some kind of connection? You're right. And if the if the power imbalance is too great, there's you're right. There's a disincentive. Why should, why should I have a relationship with you? I can crush you. Uh, I don't need a relationship with you. You either do what I say or I'll crush you, right? So you're exactly right. There needs to be an incentive. And I, and I want to keep saying that. You have to choose your confidants wisely. If you're, you take, if you're going to take what I say as a principle for better living, you can, you're only going to be able to successfully do that if you're in a community that agrees with that. If, if you're not, if you're if you're trying if you're gonna try to go to your boss after like tomorrow morning and say hey I think we need to talk about our feelings here I want you to get vulnerable with me I'll get vulnerable with you and he has no or she has no interest in doing that that's a bad idea there has to be ahead of time an agreement for us uh, to communicate in this way and can I, I can I ahead. jump in go ahead Jim yeah. Just to stress, I think what I heard from you at the beginning, yes, it's important to understand your partner's emotional being, but the first step is going deeper with your own feelings. Correct. Correct. Yes. You're, you're not going to understand her feelings very well 
if you don't understand, you're wrong. Uh, that gives you the capacity to look inside and find an analog in your own feelings to her. If I'm unaware of my own feelings, believe me, my wife's gonna pretty much feel I'm unaware of hers because I'm not gonna be able to put them into words. The, the technical uh, distinction between affects and feelings is affects are a bodily response to our environment. I'm having a raw uh, physical reaction. I'm uh, afraid, anxious, uh, sad, whatever. Now that's just a physiological reaction to my environment. Once I am able to put it into words, then we technically call it a feeling. A feeling is when I can say, oh, I was anxious. Oh, I was sad. Oh, I was hurt. Now I'm a, a much more articulate individual. I can take my physiological response and put it into words. Now I can use those words to connect to other people. So feelings are the, the ability to articulate your physiological response to life, to people, to moments. And then when I put that into words, other people have an opportunity to respond. That creates the bonding. That creates the sense of connection. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm a marriage therapist, so I'm focusing on that in marriage. But as Hal and others are, are saying, it has a much broader application too. Uh, and we're, we're seeing people even in the workplace wake up to that. I have a, I have a question. Yes, Alice. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, as you know, I am a very deep feeling person. <laughs> I would say no. emotional. Anyway, I'm reading this book called Blessed Relief. What Christians can learn from Buddhists about suffering. And I find that really, really interesting because one of the things about, for instance, anger or whatever strong feeling it is, they're talking in the book something called RAIN. So for the R, it's an acronym. So R is to recognize I'm angry. And then A is to accept that that's what I have. It's, it, it's a true feeling. And then um, I is to investigate to like, why am I angry? And then N is non-identification with that anger. It doesn't define who I am. So I can look at the anger from a perspective of, I am not the angry, you know, my essence isn't angry. It's I am having an angry feeling so I can look at it more objectively. Yeah. But I wanna add to that, not to add, shame to the feeling yeah because i think that shame or embarrassment or whatever was put upon us about feelings can really get us stuck and then we start all over again so um yes i have i have a directee who's actually a trump supporter which i didn't know <laughs> so when we do a spiritual direction she brings up a lot of her feelings about what she thinks is unfair about society or whatever and the question I have to ask myself is whatever feelings or anger or whatever it is that she has, it's sometimes projected on me. Yeah. Uh, and I have to step back. And that always helps me that, you know, my reaction or whatever, that's not really me. What is causing me to react? But it's not really who I really am. So to make that separation always helps me. She's not there to hurt me. She's hurting. She is living in her own hell right now. Right. So to have compassion for, for that, pro I don't know if I make any sense, but that's perfect. I'm yeah. trying to work through it better. Yeah, I, I, that's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, and I, I, I love that, uh, to realize there's something underneath the anger. You're not the anger. You're not your anger. There's more to you. And that's what I would say is the, you want to get to the primary emotion. What's the hurt, the fear, the frustration that's underneath the anger? Anger is secondary. So you're saying the same thing, secondary. I would say that what I would add to that, and there's a little bit of the difference between Buddhism and Christianity, but I would add to that, all of that is true. And, and what you said about shame is absolutely true. That people who have trouble with expressing their emotions or they get stuck or they're, they're too emotional or problematic, it's because they feel shame for having those feelings. That's at the core of dysfunctional expression of feelings is shame. You're absolutely right. And the extra step I was gonna add is all that's true. And in Christianity we say, and then what do we do after all that? We relate. 
Once I realize what the deeper emotion is, it's for the purpose of connection. So we would have a C, rain C at the end, you know. And after all that, what, what do we do with that? You're able to more effectively connect to other people. Um, and, and that's the, the drum I keep beating here. It makes us a more effective relational being to do everything that you just said. Uh, great insight. Okay, let's see how far we can get. So what's flexibility? Emotional flexibility is the capacity to organize emotions in multiple ways. This is a, this is a skill set. And, and so once you become aware of your emotions, which is good, let's say I get angry because I feel hurt often. I get angry because I get defensive. I get angry because I feel shame often. Or what, now what? Now we have to develop the skill of knowing what to do. In psychology, we've discovered that we are basically we are meaning makers. Uh, we 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 have emotional experiences and they mean something to us. So we learn from our emotional experiences. And then throughout life, I make meaning of every new experience that I have based on those earlier experiences. So we organize our feelings into what we call organizing principles. It's a technical term for how do I make sense of the emotional experiences of my life? And this is a, it's a cognitive process. It's a learning process, but it's mainly in the emotional centers of the brain where I have emotional experiences all up throughout my life. That teaches me something about life. I learn that and then everything filters through the grid of that what, which I've learned, what we call organizing principles. Here's the most common example of that, is that, and I, I mentioned this last week. If, let's say you grow up in a home with parents who are abusive. Uh, they beat you or maybe molested or hurt you, or maybe they were just scary, right? So you're growing up and what you learn is the people who love you are not safe. So what I learn is that vulnerability then becomes something that uh, is dangerous for me. So I've learned, I've organized vulnerability as something that's dangerous. If I'm vulnerable to people who even say they love me, I know I'm going to get hurt. And that gets ground in and it's automatic now. So here I am an adult trying to relate to other people, but I have this belief, this organizing principle that vulnerability is dangerous. So every time I get close to someone, then I get defensive. Every time I get close to someone, I have to have a fight with them. I, I find some reason to criticize them and, and pick a fight with them. And so you, I know you, you know people like this and you think, why do you keep sabotaging yourself? Why do you keep making choices that you undermine all your relationships? You keep blowing up all your relationships. Why do you do that? They'll have all these answers and none of them are the real reason. The real reason is they learn to fear vulnerability because of their childhood and early, earlier experiences, or maybe a failed first marriage. So that is really important to understand that we, we make sense out of emotional experiences, and then that becomes the lens through which we look at all relationships going forward. We're, we're fundamentally a people who uh, live by faith, not by sight, as Jesus said. Uh, really how I, I might be looking at something and I, and I see it, but it's all uh, through the grid of my perspective that shaped my, my earlier emotional experiences. We make meaning out of our emotional experiences and we, we create principles by which we live our life. And here's, here's the thing, when people often come into my office and say, I just need to change how I think. I gotta help me change how I think. I've, I've, I have these, these uh, bad experiences in, in my life and I wanna change them and get rid of them, get rid of all these bad beliefs I've got. You don't have bad beliefs, you just have too few of them. You have too few ways of looking at life. It's sometimes it is dangerous to be vulnerable. That you learn there are dangerous people in life out there. That's one thing you need to know. You also need to know that there are other times when it's a good thing to be vulnerable. So we, we need new organizing principles. We need to be flexible. Everything can't mean the same thing. Vulnerability isn't always dangerous. We have to get uh, comfortable with the uncomfortable. Uh, and, that, and that requires a process of, of uh, really working at that and understanding, well, why do you always respond that way? I, I remember this one woman who came to, to therapy that I worked with for quite a while. And it was because uh, the men in LA are all immature. 
that's why she came to therapy because all the men in LA are immature. She was single and dating all these guys. And, and every time uh, they got to some point in the relationship where there was a, a critical turning point, he would fail her. Uh, she, uh, if a guy tried to compliment her, she would think that he found her weak and, and somehow in need of uh, affirmation and support. If she wanted uh, his attention and he was too busy, then he must not be interested. Uh, if he tried to give her advice, that must mean you think I'm stupid. Uh, it was just over and over and over again where she was pushing, pushing people away. It's because she only had one way of interpreting any time a guy had some kind of response in the relationship, and that was as a criticism. That was her unconscious belief is what she grew up with, a very, very critical father. So anytime a guy tried to engage her with anything he was offering or anything, or just, just being the way he was, for her, it meant criticism. And so we could begin to open up uh, that maybe things don't mean what you think they mean. Maybe your, your first automatic interpretation of what's going on in the relationship might not be the accurate one. Maybe there are multiple ways of understanding the meaning of what you're feeling. So emotional flexibility is critical for us to navigate through relationships because all of us have grown up with disappointing childhoods in some way. And uh, we need to be able to interpret new em emotional events in a variety of ways in order for us to be successful. That takes a lot of work uh, because once you learn something in childhood to be a certain way, you don't forget it. And we don't go into your brain and erase those organizing principles. We add new ones. Uh, sometimes a guy can just be busy. And maybe he's interested, but he's busy. Uh, and if he wants to give her advice, maybe he's trying to be helpful, not because he thinks you're stupid. Uh, there are different ways of, of, of uh, looking at these emotional events and, and having to be different from what you have learned earlier in life. Emotional tolerance. Brene Brown said, you know, we need to normalize uncomfortable conversations. You've heard people say, get comfortable with the uncomfortable. I don't like that. I like Brene Brown's phrase. We need to normalize uncomfortable conversations. To be successful in life, I have to be able to tolerate intense emotions. Uh, I, um, we're, you're going to have uncomfortable conversations in every relationship and to, view that up front as normalizing it is going to get you a lot further. Now, it doesn't mean something's wrong when the uh, relationship gets intense. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I work with people who see their partner as over-emotional or fall, falling apart. This is really an unhelpful characterization of your, of your partner's emotions. People aren't over-emotional. As Alice was saying, sometimes they feel shame for having the emotions they have. That makes people look over-emotional. If I have uh, feelings, hurt feelings, angry feelings, and I feel shame for having those feelings, it's not going to be expressed effectively. What I'm probably going to do is blame you for whatever the emotion is that, I, that I'm having. Not because I'm too emotional. I'm actually not emotional enough. I'm not understanding the primary emotion underneath uh, the emotion that I'm having. And I feel bad about myself for having it. That is... Uh, one of the most toxic things you can do is to feel bad about yourself for having feelings. That feeling of shame uh, makes the expression of whatever feeling you have come out sideways. You're not gonna be as effective uh, expressing your feelings if you feel bad about yourself for having. There's a medical doctor who wrote a book called The Gift of Pain. I think that's similar to what some of you have said today. And it was uh, in that book, he, makes the analogy to leprosy. And leprosy, which we now know is a neurological disease that uh, keep people from feeling pain, particularly in their extremities. So leprosy uh, makes you go numb in your fingers, your nose, your toes. And people, when they had this disease, it's one of the oldest diseases on record, would uh, stub their toe, cut their finger, scratch their nose, they would get infected, and then they would, they would lose those parts of their body. And the reason they would lose those parts of the body is because they felt no pain. So pain is actually a gift. It, 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 it alerts you that there is something that needs your attention. So if you have an uncomfortable conversation, if it's a painful conversation, that's a gift. View it as I can learn something here. 
there's something I need to know, something we need to know. And if you have that shift in attitude from, okay, this is an opportunity as opposed to, okay, this is a problem. You don't, you don't have problem conversations, you have conversations that are opportunities. They may or may not go well, but at least that attitude gives you much more of a chance of successfully learning something from the exchange. Is there a question somebody wanted to ask? We're going to run. We're running out of time. Well, Mark, it's not so much a question as a, an, an observation. If you'll forgive me, yeah. uh, I, I was struck by a passage in your presentation earlier about uh, Christ's selection of disciples, and your inference was that Jesus was a remarkably modern person for having the insight that people with emotional maturity were better um, disciples and ambassadors than, for example, people who simply wielded authority. I mean, that was your point, right? Yeah, roughly, yes, right. Okay. And one of the reasons for that is because in these relationships, Christ recognized that there had to be accountability um, both from the believer and, uh, and from uh, God. Uh, that's why there's a covenant between the Jews and, uh, and uh, God as the chosen people. There's accountability there. God promises the promised land. The people promise to be faithful. I was struck in listening to this point about accountability in emotional relationships to think about the uh, modernity of our constitution. And I don't say that so much as a political insight as a philosophical one. The organization of our government requires accountability from opposing forces. Um, and when that doesn't seem to be in play uh, is when the system most seems out of balance. And that also sounds like a modern thing as opposed to just a convention of the Enlightenment or Locke or John Stuart Mill, that there was, there's a reciprocity in systems. And when the reciprocity in systems is ignored, the system is imperiled. Right. And that sounds as if it's consistent with what you're saying about the, right. the or uh, emotional maturity on any side of a relationship. Right. That is exactly right, and I and I agree with that. And I would say that, from my way of thinking, one of the most important concepts that shaped our constitution is the notion that uh, all men are created equal. Mm. Uh, there, that's a central biblical teaching, Judeo-Christian biblical teaching that has to do with this accountability and reciprocity. Everything I'm saying today is based on that one notion. If you're created in the image of God, which is what you know the Bible says, then that's where you get that notion that all men are created equal. Now, even we, of course, we know they couldn't live up to that in their own lives. They still got the idea. They ripped it off from the Bible, and it, it became a core principle for setting up this unbelievably successful experiment here uh, in America. That notion of reciprocity, of respect for the other, that uh, all people are created equal. I mean, it took us a couple hundred years to get to that, <laughs> what they were saying, but uh, it was built into the system. Yes, that notion of reciprocity, mutual respect, responsiveness. Now I'm, I'm fine tuning that by talking about emotions as, as the way to do that, the vehicle to do that, but the principles is there. Uh, I, I think I agree with that, Hal. I think that's a, I have, a, I have a suggestion for next week. Yeah. Take it or leave it. Um, I, I, my own personal take on emotions is that sometimes uh, being overly intellectual is not helpful. Um, so getting back to the Bible, uh, for, for good and bad and ugly, I'm a Peter at the dinner table, uh, at the communion table. And I think Peter's a good example because he clearly was somebody with intense emotions mm -hmm. and he was distinct from the other disciples. 
Uh, everybody that's listening today probably can identify with one or the other of the disciples. Uh, that's my identification. And it might be fun to explore how Jesus and Peter dealt with this issue. Yeah, I think that's a really good example. Uh, and I look forward to our conversations as always. We'll, we'll stop there for now. We will follow up this next week. will be our last of the three and talking about emotions, Jesus, and culture. So thank you all for coming today. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to seeing you all next week. Thanks, Mike.